Good morning, y'all, and welcome to another week of FCC Youth Sunday School. I hope that you had a good week. I hope that you're doing well. If you have any prayer requests this week, let me know in the comments. I'd love to be praying for you and with you this week. Before we get, begin our class today, would you please pray with me? Creator and sustainer God, thank you for the ways that you continue to bless us, the ways that you are continuing to show your faithfulness to us during this time. Help us to be agents of your love and your peace in this world. Give us um, the strength to continue on when we feel like we are um, done with all of this quarantine, when we're bored, when we're tired. Um, help us to be people who show your love to the world. God, we love you. We know that you love us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So this week, we're going to jump right back into the Gospel of Mark. We've been here for a couple of weeks now talking about what it means for the kingdom of heaven to be here and now. And you know, a lot of times when we think about the kingdom of heaven or the reign of God, we think about, you know, when we die, we go away somewhere further away to this place that we call heaven where there's these golden streets. And it's something that only happens later on, that we don't have to worry about it now. But I think that what the Gospel of Mark is telling us is that the kingdom of heaven is happening here and now, and that we as Christians are called into that kingdom to experience the reality of what Jesus is doing and to further that reality in our world today so that others can experience it as well. So with that in mind, let's jump into chapter 9. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me. Um, we're going to start in verse 14. When they came to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and experts in the law arguing with them. When the whole crowd saw him, they were amazed and ran at once and greeted him. He asked them, what are you arguing about with them? A member of the crowd said, said to him, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that makes him mute. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they weren't able to do it. He answered them, you unbelieving generation, how much longer must I be with you? How much longer must I endure you? Bring him to me. So they brought the boy to him. When the spirit saw him, it immediately threw the boy into, con into a convulsion. He fell on the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It has often thrown him into fire or water to destroy him. But if you're able to do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Then Jesus said to him, if you are able, all things are possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the father of the boy cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. Now, when Jesus saw that the crowd was quickly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. It shrieked, threw him into a terrible convulsion, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that he said, he's dead. But Jesus gently took his hand and raised him to his feet, and he stood up. Then after he went into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we cast it out? And he told them, this kind can only come out by prayer. So this is one of my favorite chapters in the book of Mark. Um, there are a few stories in this chapter that I think are really meaningful and can really help us explore what the kingdom of God is all about. And this is the first story that I'm talking about here. And my favorite verse in this chapter, maybe, maybe in the whole Bible, is verse 24. The father's response to Jesus. Immediately, the father of the boy cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. You know, when I think about belief, I think about growing up as a kid and all of the things that we believe in as children. We believe in Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy and the Easter Bunny. Um, and slowly over time, we figure out that maybe these things aren't as real as we once believed them to be. Um, and I think that in similar ways, religion works the same, right? Um, it's really easy to believe as children. But as we grow older, we start asking more questions and we have more doubts. 
And I think a lot of the time religion has told us and church has told us that it's not okay to ask questions, that it's not okay to have doubts, that it's not okay to not believe 100% all of the time. And I think that this story is a very clear representation of that that's false. That the people in the Bible, the people who were following Jesus, the people who literally saw Jesus, the people who were there among Jesus, watching him perform miracles, still had struggles believing. But the beauty of this story is that the father says, I believe, help my unbelief. And so Jesus does. Jesus doesn't abandon the father because he doesn't believe 100%. I think sometimes in our lives, it can feel like if we don't believe in the Bible or in God or in Jesus 100%, then we're automatically abandoned. But that's not the case. When we have doubts and when we have struggles, uh, when we're stuck in quarantine and we're angry, Jesus is there with us. God is there with us, holding us. We are not abandoned and we are not alone. In fact, I think that this prayer, that this statement, I believe, help my unbelief, is one of the most faithful statements that one can make. It's recognizing that, you know, I don't have all the answers, and I can't say for sure 100% anything, but God, you can, so help me. You know, I think if we can all learn to say this prayer to make this statement in our lives each and every day that we would be better for it. That recognizing our own limitations and giving those to God is an important step in the Christian journey. And it's important. It's an important aspect of the kingdom of God. This kingdom is not about um, knowing all of the answers. It's not about doing all of the right things all of the time in order to make it. It's about the journey of understanding, the journey of giving over your life to God, your struggles, your hurts, your worries, your disbelief. Um, it's a hard lesson to learn, but it's a fruitful one. And I hope that during this week, you can think about that, that you can, in times where belief is difficult, um, I know that the pandemic Maybe for some of you, this is a difficult time to believe. Um, I hope that this story is an encouragement to you. That even Jesus knows that, hey, they're not going to get it 100% of the time, all of the time. And that's okay, because I'm here with them. And so I want to continue on a little bit further down. We're going to jump to verse 33. All right. And this is a section entitled, Questions About the Greatest. And it's important here to remember the story that we just went over, and specifically the fact that the disciples have just failed. They fall on their faces. They did not, they were not able to heal the young boy. They had to call in the professional to do it. Um, and then we get to verse 33, and this happens. So follow along with me. Then they came to Capernaum. After Jesus was inside the house, he asked them, so what were you discussing along the way? But they were silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. After he sat down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he must be last and servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them. T taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but welcomes the one who sent me. Now, first of all, let's talk about the fact that the disciples, who just failed miserably, fell on their faces, are now, what, a uh, story later, arguing with each other about who is the greatest among all of them. Um, I think that we can really probably relate to this, right? Uh, a lot of us would like to be the greatest. We'd like to be the smartest, the fastest, the strongest. Um, we're competitive people, right? And so... This is just kind of part of our nature. We're like the disciples, and we would like to say, well, no, I'm the greatest. I'm going to be sitting next to Jesus. I am going to be God's right-hand man in this life. But Jesus kind of flips it and says, well, it's not about being the greatest. 
Because if you really want to be the greatest, then you have to be last. You have to be the least. And the example that Jesus uses here is a child. And in ancient times, and when Jesus was going along and doing his ministry, children were literally the least. Children were considered property. They didn't do anything. They uh, took up space. They took up food. They um, roamed around the streets, maybe went to school, maybe started learning a trade. But ultimately, children were worse off than women. They were worse off than even the lowest of the low in society. Children meant nothing. And so for Jesus to take a child and to say, whoever welcomes one of these little children, whoever welcomes one of these people who the rest of society says is worthless, welcomes me. And by welcoming me, they welcome the one who sent me. When we think about the kingdom, and when we think about the reign of God here and now, I hope that we think about those who have been left on the margins, those who seem like they've been on the outs. As Christians, we're called to welcome. And it's not like an easy welcome, like just welcome the people that look like you, or the people that talk like you, or the people that um, have the same beliefs and ideas as you. This welcome is a welcome for all people, and specifically those people whose society says we don't want. So I think that we're a lot like the disciples here, that we can move forward saying that we're Christians, that we follow Jesus, that we believe, and then we fail, and we forget that it only takes asking for help. We get so bogged down in our competition with others, comparing ourselves to whoever is next to us, that we forget that the kingdom isn't about just us. It's about all people in all places, in all times. It's about those who don't look like us. It's about those who don't speak like us. It's about those who don't believe like us. And so this week, when we think about what it means to live into the kingdom of God and to invite others into that kingdom, I hope that we can remember two things. That number one, it's not just up to you to hold your own belief. It's okay to ask for help. Sometimes that help comes from parents. Sometimes it comes from siblings or friends. God shows up in many, many ways. All you have to do is ask for help. And number two, that the kingdom of heaven is for all people, specifically for the least of these. Because when we welcome those who don't look like us, when we welcome those who don't belong according to society's standards, then we are welcoming Christ. So what does that look like going forward in 2020? I don't know, but I entrust that you guys will figure it out and that we will all be on this journey of figuring it out together. Have a good week. Let me know if you need anything, and I will see you on Wednesday night at 5.30 for our Zoom call. See you then.